Family Theater presents Donna Atwood. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The First Voyage of Columbus. And now, here is your hostess, Donna Atwood. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, The First Voyage of Columbus, featuring Jan Arvan as Christopher Columbus. think of Columbus, most of us first remember the rhyme we learned in school to help us remember the date of his discovery of America. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Then perhaps we find before our mind's eye the picture of his three ships, the Santa Maria, the Pinta, and the Nina, moving before the wind on the green and swelling vastness of an unknown sea. For this is what most of us consider the voyage of Columbus. But actually, it was only a small part of his journey. It really began when Columbus, unheralded and unknown, was making his way across Spain to Cordoba, to the court of Isabella and Ferdinand. Chance, or perhaps an act of God, caused him to stop at Palos, at the convent of Santa Maria de la Rabida. And it was there that he was given his first real hope of success when he told his plan to Father Juan Perez de Marchena, the guardian of the convent and a noted cosmographer whose work was known to the queen. To reach the east by sailing west? I believe the plan is sound. But the motive... My primary motive, Father would be the extension of Christianity to the Eastern world. Hmm. Primary? Not the spices, the silks and riches of the East? Father, a few years ago I commanded a vessel of the Genoese fleet when Genoa was at war with Venice. In my last encounter, my ship and one of the enemies caught fire while the two were bound together by cordage and grappling irons. Both ships were lost, and for the most part, so were the crews. And I myself would not have survived if Providence had not thrown a large oar in my way. With the oar to keep me afloat, I made the shore some five miles away. God saved my life. Mm. I choose to believe he did it for a reason. I do not believe it was so that I might grow fat merchandising eastern trade goods. Good. Good. And so, with no friends at court and no letters of introduction... You come to Spain to further your mission. Hmm. My friend, you are either very courageous or very naive. Well, stay with us a while, hmm? Here at Santa Maria de la Rabida. I am, uh, I am known to Queen Isabella. I will write to her for you. You rest, meanwhile. Prepare the arguments you will need. But let me tell you one thing now, my friend... Yes, Father? If she accepts the plan, she may not, but if she does, she will ask what you yourself want from this venture. State your motives as you stated them to me. But also you must ask for more. Drive a bargain and stand by it. Or otherwise you will probably be under suspicion and your mission will surely end in failure. Under suspicion, Father? An Italian businessman working for profit and reputation might be trusted in Spain. But an Italian missionary working for the glory of God and Spain? Hmm. <laughs> Never. And there is another reason, my friend. Your motives, they are good, they're very good. 
from a priest, they would be highly acceptable. For a layman, Columbus, they sound a little too good to be true. Christopher Columbus stayed at the convent of Santa Maria de la Rabida, and with the wise Father Marchena, extended his studies and his prayers for the success of his undertaking. Then, with more faith in his plan than ever, and an array of learning to maintain it, he continued his journey to Cordova, where he presented himself to the Queen. Though we have heard your plan and are favorably inclined, the Moorish War absorbs all our thoughts and so much of our resources as to make such an undertaking almost impossible at this time. We do, however, promise our aid when the war should be ended, unless a committee of our advisors recommend it be undertaken at an earlier time. Gentlemen, you are learned men. Surely you can see the benefits to be gained. It is not the benefits which are in question before this council. Rather, your methods. To achieve the East by sailing west. Why, surely you yourself must question such a scheme as this. Not at all. The great cosmographer Toscanelli, as well as your own father Marchena, both attest to the probable soundness of the plan. As you have said, we are learned men, and as such, at least are able to, uh, perhaps with reservations, accept your theory as to the shape of the earth on which we live. It is round as any... moment. Your pardon. As I was about to say, we might accept your theory. For sake of argument, let us say we do. That we believe one might reach Cathay by sailing westward and thereby bring Christianity to the East. A noble motive. How large a ship would be required? How large a ship? If it were to be undertaken at all, it should be a fleet of ships. It is a fleet of ships. <laughs> Gentlemen, you heard. A fleet of ships. <laughs> Senora, you are familiar with the sea. I have sailed since my 14th year from the Pillars of Hercules to the Archipelago. And have knowledge of sailors as a commander and as a common seaman. I have. Well, then surely you're aware of the superstitions and the legends common to such men. You ask for a fleet. Yet if we were to give you even one ship, how would you sail it? How indeed, if your men believed you to be intent on leading them off the edge of the world. <laughs> I, I did not come here to amuse you. I have come to offer Spain an opportunity. The kings are at war with Granada, the last of the Moorish kingdoms. I have been told this over and over since I arrived as an excuse. But, gentlemen... Gentlemen, the value of spices brought back from Cathay would do much to defray the costs of this war. A short route to the east would make possible the extension of Christianity and increase Spain in glory in the eyes of God and of the world. Gentlemen, I bring you opportunity. Is, is that a matter of laughter? Well, you must bear with us, Senor Columbus. If we view this opportunity, as did the Genoese and the Phoenicians and the Portuguese, to whom we understand you've also offered it, is this not true? It is true. And it is true, too, that your Queen Isabella is favorably inclined to my project and has promised her assistance. When the war should be ended, if she is still so inclined. Uh, having been appointed to this council by Her Highness, Senor Columbus... We must inform her of our opinion in the matter and urge her, as befits our stations, to projects of a more practical nature to a nation at war. To understand... I fail to see what could be more practical to a nation than gaining the favor of God by bringing his word to the East, or more practical to the war than defraying its cost through the import of Eastern goods. And... Till such time as the war with Granada should be ended, you will be given employment here in Cordova suitable to your abilities. When the war is ended, you may again petition the Queen. 
Until that time, the matter is closed. And the matter was closed. Columbus remained for six years, in vain urging his project. Then in November of 1491, he lost all hope of success through the Spanish thrones and returned to Palos and his first friend in Spain, Padre Marchena. But my friend, the queen did promise aid when the war should be completed. Good father, I've been through this a thousand times in my own mind. No, there's no course open now. So you will take your project to the court of France? To France. Wait, Columbus, wait a little longer. Wait? Wait for what, Father? For the war to end? What purpose would it serve, Father? I have waited out six years already. I will write the Queen another letter. I want to tell her what you intend to do. Urge her as strongly as I can not to lose so great an opportunity. Then, too, there is an officer at the court. There is a man who has been growing in influence, and I will write to him also. And then, if nothing happens, then I will send you off to France with my blessings. But will you wait out the winter? Yes, Father. I will wait. Granada fell on the 30th of December, 1491. And before the end of the winter, Columbus stood at the court before the Queen of Spain. We have heard much about you in recent days, Christopher Columbus. I am flattered, Your Highness. In fact, we hold in our hand a letter from our dear friend, the friar Juan Perez de Marchena, who commends you to us as a man of notable virtue and great vision who seeks earnestly to serve God and Spain. Uh, but then, perhaps you have read the letter? It is so filled with praise and recommendation, it had occurred to us that you might have helped the good friar write it. <laughs> <laughs> there was no need, Your Highness. The good father has always made a habit of serving me better than I could possibly serve myself. <laughs> uh, we have that in common, then. Now, what is your price? My price, Your Highness? If we were to commission you to find us a new trade route to the east by sailing west. Uh, no, that, no, my children, this is no <laughs> laughing matter. <laughs> well... My price is quite high. The war has been expensive, Christopher Columbus, but we will consider anything reasonable. First, not less than three ships with full complement and provisions uh, to be commissioned an admiral of the ocean. Indeed? Viceroy of all new found lands. And to receive one-tenth of all the gold, precious stones, and other commodities exported from them. That will be enough. We, we find your price too high, Christopher Columbus. The interview is ended. The gall of the man! You heard him? I did, Your Highness. Yes, Your Highness. Well, what do you think? You are my advisor's advice. The man is bold. And this is the man Friar Marchena recommended for his virtue. Perhaps, uh, perhaps the man of God is a better judge of virtue than an angry queen. You, you dare say that to me? I meant no offense, Your Highness. I'm merely curious as to whether you want my agreement or my counsel. Perhaps we'd better tell you that after we've heard the counsel. You... You like the man, don't you? I do. And you? To me, it's refreshing to find a man with such enthusiasm and such faith in himself. Yes, I like him, Your Highness. And I do not think his price too high. You do not think his price too high? No, madam. I do not. If you will reflect a moment, you will see, as we did, that it only sounded high. Indeed, it is only a token price. 
involving only a token title. That and the expedition costs themselves. You see, he means to find a new trade route to Cathay, the Far East. With no expectation of finding any new lands over which to be appointed viceroy, or from which to exact any 10% for gold or precious stones exported from them. <laughs> By no stretch of definition could Cathay be considered a newfound land. It would seem, then, that his prize is to be made Admiral of the Ocean and to have the opportunity of extending the holy faith to the Far East. For God and country. In a stricter sense, for God alone. The man is an Italian. But should he find new lands? The chance is always there. If he should, I would say he'd be welcome to his 10%. If this man is sent away, as indeed he seems to have been already... Spain will not even have her 90%. 90% of something is certainly better than 100% of nothing. His price is low. The title and the costs of the expedition. Even that right now. Oh, the war has been costly. If one would make gains, one must take risks. The uh, pinsons might supply one ship and ships compliments drawn from the military we we will make the voyage send a rider after the man we will make the voyage if I have to pledge my jewels to obtain the money on the 30th of April 1492 Christopher Columbus was made Grand Admiral of the Ocean, Viceroy of all the islands and mainlands he might discover. And at the harbor at Palos, three ships were made ready. An old but serviceable carrack, furnished by the city of Palos, Columbus made his flagship and named it for the Mother of God, the Santa Maria. And two smaller craft, the Pinta, given by Castile, and the Nina, a gift of the Pinzon family. On the 3rd of August, 1492, early mass was celebrated at Santa Maria de la Rabida. Prayers were offered for the success of the venture and for the health and well-being of the 120 men of the complement. And then, shortly before noon, the expedition sailed out of the Bay of Palos, sailing westward to find a new route to the east. At the Canary Islands, the ships were detained so that the sails and rigging of the Nina could be altered for greater speed. And there, Columbus heard that three Portuguese vessels had been sent out to capture or defeat the expedition. But he eluded them as his flotilla sailed on boldly into the frightening, almost infinite vastness of the unknown sea. I do not like it, my captain. Why not? The wind is fair and from a friendly quarter, and the weather, perfect. The sea, my captain, the sea. I've been a sailor all my life, and I've grown a kinship with the seas I've sailed. But not this one. This one is strange. Stranger than any I've ever seen. Patches of strange lighted water in the night. The reflections of the starlight. Aye, and strange stars in the heavens. We are free of the dust of the mainland. We just see stars we have not been able to see before. Perhaps, my captain, stars we were never meant to see. I say turn back. God did not bring us this far without a purpose. There will be no turning back. My captain, the mariner's compass no longer points due north. It inclines westward. This is an omen. Don't speak to me of omens, Senor Pinzon. I count such things as an affront to God. But the compass... Make allowance for the degree of change and navigate accordingly. Yes, my captain, but still... Or cannot... forget the compass and plot by the stars. Or do they too incline to the westward? If this is your order, Captain, I will ignore the compass and pilot by the stars. Is that all? No. Wait. Yes, sir? I... I did not mean to be short with you, Pinzon. The compass variation troubles me as it does you. But we put ourselves in the hands of God and his blessed mother before we left Palos. 
faith is never wasted, Pinzon. There is no need to be apprehensive. Our lives are in good hands. For a time, things went well for the Admiral of the Ocean and his small flotilla. And the days went by with the monotony now common to sea travelers. But to these men, who had never been more than three days out of sight of land, there was a difference in the monotony. A growing fear, an increasing apprehension, as they moved farther from home and the security of land. Then, on the 7th of October, 1492, 65 days from the mainland of Europe. What is this? Who is leader among you? Hold, hold. The men have elected me their spokesman. Then come and speak. Well? Captain, Captain, you say? You still recognize me then? For a moment I thought this was a mutiny. When I saw you approach the bridge bearing arms and long faces, but... Now I see it's only a conference. We've had enough of this foolish mission. I say return to Spain. Aye. You say, but you are not the spokesman, I have been informed. And it's a good thing that you are not, for it would certainly not be wise if all of you were putting yourself at odds with the commander of the captain of this ship, the admiral of this flotilla. That would be mutiny. I beseech you, be reasonable. You say this to me, Pinzon, be reasonable would appear to me that it is you, all of you who have lost reason. A man loses reason when he gains fear. There is reason and fear! This voyage has taken us beyond any reasonable distance. If we continue, we will all be lost. Can it be that one Italian has more courage than almost 120 Spaniards? It is not a matter of courage! Foolhardiness is not bravery. It is madness. I am not mad, Pinzona. I am angry. Through the grace of God, we're on the very doorstep of the east. You all are men of the sea. You all can read the stars and know the distance we have traveled. Now, when we might almost reach out our hands and touch the Orient, you are ready to turn and run. Are you indeed sailors afraid of the sea? Or are you men? Do you want to return in failure? When you might return in triumph? We are afraid, my captain, of not returning at all. You will return to your homes and loved ones. There's not a man here or aboard the Nina and the Pinta who has not felt the hand of God in his life. And he's with us now. And he will protect us as he has since we left Palos because we're on a holy mission to bring his word to the east to extend the holy faith he gave us. Put away your arms. Replace them with your beads that you might give thanks to God for his goodness. That you might give thanks to God for allowing you to be his instruments. And you will be his instruments. For we have started for the Indies and I intend to pursue this voyage till, by the grace of God, it is ended. That night was spent in watching, and as Columbus urged, in prayer. Then at ten o'clock, from the deck of the Santa Maria, strange lights were seen moving in the distance. At two in the morning, Juan Rodriguez Bermejo, a sailor aboard the Santa Maria, sighted land. Land ho! Land ho! West away up our On sighting the New World, Columbus ordered first that the three ships move close to each other and that the Te Deum be sung in thanksgiving to God for success and a safe journey. On the morning of October 12th, 1492, the three ships of Columbus dropped anchor before an island resplendent with the brilliant green of mangrove trees. Then, with the captains of the other two ships, Arrayed in a scarlet mantle and bearing the royal standard with the figure of Christ on the cross, 
he landed on the shores of the New World, planted the cross, and named the island in honor of the Holy Savior, San Salvador. So it was with the first voyage of Columbus. He made other voyages to and from the New World, one of them in chains under Spanish arrest. But his motives remained the same. The only profits he ever gained from the discovery of America were spiritual. And the only worldly things he kept in memory of his discovery were his chains and his title, Grand Admiral of the Ocean. Well, this is Donna Atwood again. In the play you've just heard, The First Voyage of Columbus, you probably noticed that we dealt more with the motives of the man than with his actual discovery of America. And in a sense, that's the way it should be. Because why people do things can be, and usually is, every bit as important as the things they do. Do you follow me? Well, here's what I mean. Suppose a man jumps off a bridge into a raging river. That could be a terrible thing. Or it could be a wonderful thing. The why is all important. If he jumps with the idea of destroying himself, it's terrible because he commits a grave crime against society and a terrible sin against God and himself. But if he's risking his life, if he's jumping in order to save others from drowning then he's doing something worthy of the highest praise on society and a great reward from God. Then it's a wonderful thing. Yes, motives are important, and there is no action which does not have its motivation. I believe most of us pray, and generally for the same reasons, to thank God for past favors, to ask Him for new ones, or perhaps for his divine assistance in solving the problems that come up in our lives. But we who appear on family theater generally recommend family prayer, and we, too, have our reasons. We believe family prayer is a special instrument capable of bringing the members of a family closer to God and therefore closer to each other. We believe that by including God in the group, it increases love in the home and strengthens family ties and makes home a happier place. So next time you pray, try it with the members of your family. As little as two or three minutes a day devoted to God in the company of your loved ones can be a valuable investment. And the motive's a good one. The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed The First Voyage of Columbus. Donna Atwood was your hostess. Featured in our cast were Jan Arban, Howard Culver, Margaret Brayton, Lawrence Dobkin, Don Diamond, and Lou Krugman. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week when family theater will present Reprisal, starring Rita Johnson, and Blythe will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.